takový směšný byl. Dívám se, vězněli nás dvanáct chochlů. Mezi nimi on a pláče pravil, odsoudili. Bašuní a vím by jsou syn. A píšet, píšet, no povídám si, že by stechl. A on pořád píšet, pořád píšet, a jen to dopsal. Taky propadla moje hlava. Zle tam se námi točil ten major. Spíl a tloukl, či tam jak babi. Báli se ho, mouři se pokli, na majora se omluvili. A já hned z rána půjčil jsem si u souseda důž. Na majora čeká. Jede všetl mezi chochlí. Vletěl major, co to? Já čar i bůh. Jak to řek, byl nůž mojich rukou. Ne, praví, vaše blahorodí. A jdu k němu blíž a blíž. Jak by bylo možno, byste nám byl car i bůh. A ty co, zbojník? Ne, praví. A jdu k němu blíž a blíž. Bůh nás vševohoucí, vševědoucí, on jedin jest, on jedin jest. A car, on jedin je si nade všemi námi, a vy, pravím, vy jste jedno major carské milosti a pro vaše zásluhy, jak, 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 zak dákal, podlce mu nůž do života. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Insight. My name is Chloe Miller-Smith, and I'm a producer here at the Royal Opera House. Tonight, we're going to be exploring Leos Janáček's powerful final work, From the House of the Dead, as the Royal Opera prepare to stage it for the first time here at Covent Garden next month. Our thanks there to Stefan Margita and Nick Fletcher for that brilliant performance. That was Luca's story from Act One, and we've got plenty more to come. In a few minutes, I'll be joined by members of the cast, Pascal Chabonneau, Stefan Margita, and Ladislav Elga. We'll be talking about their characters and what it's like to sing Janicek's music. Conductor Mark Wigglesworth will then introduce us to Janicek's score, and later on we'll be joined by director Christoph Waliskowski to talk about his take on From the House of the Dead. But first, to introduce us to Janicek and the story behind the piece, please welcome writer and broadcaster Gavin Plumley. On the 12th of August, 1928, 
in a sanatorium in the Czech city of Ostrava. A white-haired, 74-year-old man died. Pneumonia was the cause, the result of a chill that he had caught in a forest some 30 kilometers south of the city. The man's name was Leos Janáček, a composer. In fact, the leading composer in Czechoslovakia at that time. At his death, he left behind some nine operas, including his very final work, From the House of the Dead. And he'd been checking the proofs of that score just before his sudden final illness. This last opera is based on Dostoevsky's account of his time in a Siberian prison camp under Tsarist rule during the, during the 1850s. Dostoevsky wrote the book after he was imprisoned for his part in a political conspiracy. Fictionalizing some elements, he created a narrative that encompasses both detached descriptions of the daily survival of the prisoners and also the protagonist and narrator Alexander Goryanchikov's sense of a kind of encroaching or impending redemption in these dismal surroundings. And it was the raw power of that story that led Janacek to create his fiercest score, in which he shone a light in some, in some of the grimmest corners of a Russian penitentiary. By beginning with From the House of the Dead, and it's the first of a series of operas that are going to be presented by Janacek here at the Royal Opera House over the coming seasons, and indeed by beginning at the end of his life um, this evening, I suppose I've missed out quite a big chunk of the story. That story about a composer's tenacity. So I'd better go right back to the beginning. Because Janacek's not like any other composer, really. He was a maverick. His sound world is completely unlike anyone else's. His choice of subject matter, too. And even the way he approached creating operas was entirely unique. Many, including some of the greatest musical minds in Europe working at that time, Gustav Mahler, among them, didn't get Janacek. Well, where did this non-conformist come from? His story actually begins sort of traditionally enough, born a sort of farmstead or homestead in deep Moravian countryside in a village called Hukvaldi. And he left that behind as a boy to move to the capital of Moravia, Brno, where he studied at a monastery school. And his somewhat traditional education continued at the conservatoires in Leipzig, Prague, and Vienna. But he decided to return to Brno, where he set up his own rather esoteric um, music college, and he lived in the gardens of that institution. As a composer, he tried to follow in the footsteps at first of his compatriots like Smetna and Vorjak. He even nicked his first libretto um, from Vorjak, or rather a libretto that was intended for Vorjak, and it was called Shaka. And it's a really grand piece, just like the historical epic operas that were be being performed in Prague during the 19th century. In the end, the librettist said to Janacek that he couldn't use the text. And in rejection, unfortunately, was going to be a major part of Janacek's early career. But he was unbowed, and he continued and moved on to his second opera, The Beginning of a Romance, which became the crucible for his concentrated study of Moravian folk music. Distinct from that of Western Bohemia, the music of Eastern Moravia has its own types of scale and harmony. And that suffused Janacek's music, particularly in his third opera, the one that came next, Yei Pastorkinia, or Her Stepdaughter. And for those of you who have never heard of that, there's a reason for that, because we more commonly know it as Yenufa. Well, the premiere of Yenufa in Brno in 1904 should have been Janacek's breakthrough. Drawing on the intrinsic relationship between music and text in Moravian folk music, and also his understanding of the kind of rhythmic power of everyday speech, Janacek had created a whole new way of setting prose and indeed creating drama. 
But so fresh was his approach that many didn't understand it. Gustav Mahler at that time was the director of the Opera House in Vienna, and he rejected the piece. And in Prague, where Janáček really focused his attentions, the music director of the National Theatre, one Karol Kovacevic, um, was going to be an even tougher nut, nut for um, Janáček to crack. It was slightly unfortunate because Kovacevic was still smarting from a negative review that Janáček had written about one of his own operas. And so he decided that he was going to block the path of Yenufa for some 12 years. That was until he decided he to create his own reorchestrated version of the piece. But in trying to make Janacek sound like all the other Czech repertoire that was being performed at that time, Kovacevic totally misunderstood his idiom. Nonetheless, that somewhat romanticized version of Yanufa, first heard in Prague and then in Vienna, with all the jagged edges smoothed out, um, signaled Janacek's acceptance, wider acceptance. And it provided him with a real boost. And that coincided with the beginning of his romance with a woman called Kamala Stoeslava, who, whether she liked it or not, was going to be his muse for the final decade of his life. And exactly 100 years ago this year, the Czech land's independence from Habsburg, Vienna. Well, Janáček's new self-confidence allowed him really to be himself. And being himself meant ignoring the rules, writing operas exactly how he wanted. Uh, in fact, in the way he wrote them and indeed what he based them on. So The Cunning Little Vixen is based on a cartoon strip from his local newspaper. While From the House of the Dead uh, draws on Dostoevsky's unflinching reportage. And even when he was adapting plays like um, the Russian dramatist Ostrovsky's The Storm, which became Katya Kabanova, Janacek stripped away loads of text, even some of the characters, to create this sort of new type of driving drama. And he saw the operatic in the most unoperatic material, like the Macropolis Affair, the original playwright of which thought that was so talkative that it could never be set to music. But that was the whole point. Janáček was creating a new brand of opera, and one that was really concise. One orchestral musician once quipped that you cannot possibly dislike a composer who has you in the pub by 9.30 p.m. <laughs> and that concision is there in the music too. Janáček never wraps things up in velvety violins. Instead, he distills his character psychology into vivid musical postcards, sometimes using the strangest combination of instruments. Within his diverse output, there was one theme that he returned to time and again. It was the idea of being a Slav. Janacek rejected the predominance of Austrian and German culture, particularly, of course, in Central Europe. And he's turned instead to the East. Janacek and his wife named their children Olga and Vladimir. And there are endless tomes of Russian literature in his library. He based, works, uh, he based his musical works on pieces of writing by Gogol and Tolstoy. He even thought of uh, writing an opera of Anna, Anna Karenina, and would that he had done that. And of course, right at the end of his life, he turned to another Russian subject from the House of the Dead. The idea of basing an opera on Dostoevsky's memoirs first occurred to Janáček in February eight, uh, 1927. It was a really bold choice. But what was even more astonishing was the, the way Janáček approached this task. It was developed over the course of 11 months, with Janáček actually working directly from the original Russian. He moved episodes around and cut out, cut out large um, chunks of the text to create his own patchwork of the inmates' stories. A fluid, continuous narrative was no longer important to Janáček. It was about atmosphere. It was about psychology. And he worked so quickly from the Russian that he often just transliterated the original straight into Czech, sometimes even writing in Cyrillic script. By this point in his career, Janáček's skills were so well honed 
that he could transform Dostoevsky's reportage into his opera without any immediate sketch or plan. The speed with which Janacek worked was instantly apparent when he showed his friends and colleagues the score. And you can see the first page of it on screen right now. As with many of his late works, From the House of the Dead is quite sparsely orchestrated at times, with the voices often accompanied by just one or two instruments. But to make matters more complicated, he didn't use manuscript paper to write this opera, but drew the staves freehand onto paper. The combination of Janacek's absolutely abysmal handwriting and the erratic shifts from three instruments on one page and 20 uh, lines on another with vocal lines too made the essential task of copying the score, so it was ready for publication and rehearsals, etc., almost impossible. But by June 1928, there was a complete version of the score, and having checked the proofs of the first two acts in Brno, he went off to his cottage in Hochwaldi, where he was born. He bought the cottage with the proceeds from his earlier operas, and he took act three under his arm. Unfortunately, Janacek never completed those final corrections. After his death, two devoted pupils took up the challenge of preparing the complete final score, including, of course, that last act. But they made errors, and more importantly, errors of judgment. Um, they even changed the final scene of the opera into something much more optimistic. And it's taken until now, as in this year, 2018, with the publication of the new critical edition of the score for Janacek's brilliant but rather more cynical original to see the light of day. What is now apparent is that Janacek created a deliberately fragmentary story with a score to match. He focused on the essential qualities of Dostoevsky's original, the spark of God, as he called it, in each of its characters. And the batteries of percussion and the eccentric orchestrations, including whips, swords, chains, picks, shovels, rattles, and an anvil, all help give this unflinching account yet more credibility, distilling the prisoners' stories and their feelings into daring but defined musical gestures. So although we're beginning at the end of Janacek's life, it's really the perfect place to start. His final opera, From the House of the Dead, is absolutely representative of who he was. A man who could breathe operatic life into almost anything. Thank you. Many thanks to Gavin Plumley there for that fascinating insight into the work. We'll hear a little bit more about the score later from Mark Wigglesworth. Um, but please, first, welcome key characters from, from the House of the Dead. Uh, cast members Stefan Margita and Pascal Chabonneau and Ladislav Elga. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I know you're midway through rehearsals, very busy, so we appreciate your time. It's looked nice. It's looking good? It is. Excellent. You, you should all come invitation. and see it. <laughs> <laughs> We're already plugging the show. Um, I wondered first if we could start just talking about your characters. Stefan, who are you playing? Great, man. Very bad. Really very bad. Uh, maybe you know, uh, I'm Luka Kuzmich in prison, but nobody knows, just the Shishko knows. I have the other name, it's the, the Filka Morozov. Okay. Um, this aria about you, the aria is the story, what I say here, it's the story about the, the major, how I killed him. Mm -hmm. And just Shishkov, if you come to the prison, he knows I am Filka Morozov. And why? That's why I say the Krzysztof Valdikowski, because it's a very long and nice story. Okay. Very good. Pascal, tell me about your character. I'm playing the part of Alieja. And uh, he's, um, if you look at his character from Dostoevsky's book, 
Um, he's a young Tartar who's, uh, who's been uh, arrested for doing some, some robbery. I think he was a, the, the, the term is a highwayman. And uh, so he finds himself in a Siberian prison. I mean, this is, this is not the setting that we're doing, of course, in, in, uh, here at the Royal Opera House. But um, in the novel, that's, that's, that's what he is. Um, so he's, um, I would say, he's a, is he a teenager? Okay. Must be between uh, 16 and 20 years old. Great. So you're playing ages. Yeah. 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 Very nice. Yeah. Doesn't have to act at all. Actually. <laughs> no. <laughs> Wrinkle free. He's my best friend in, in prison. Right. Absolutely the best friend for everything, you know, for money, for drugs, everything. Isn't that what all of it's our good, best friends yeah? are about? <laughs> money is <laughs> What he means is that I work for him. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It's very polite of you. <laughs> and Ladislav, tell us about your character. The name of my character is Alexander Skuratov, uh, another uh, very man of good qualities. Um, <laughs> so I killed a German. And uh, I think that I'm looking all the time for uh, forgiveness or for, uh, for the, uh, to, to, to make people understand that it's, it's not, I, have done, I haven't done anything bad because I killed him only because I was in love with a girl, and he obviously uh, wanted to take her away from me, so uh, you kill a man, that's, that's what you do. Of course, that's a nice story. Yeah, yeah, sounds lovely. I would have done the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> we are strong characters all, all around the, the and that, That's only the beginning, isn't it? You are the best one. You think? I think, yeah. I have the best chance to get out, I think. <laughs> and Stefan, we heard you singing just at the beginning of this evening. We'll talk a little bit about what challenges there are in playing the roles, but tell me first about the music. What is it like singing Janacek's music? You know, yeah, for me it's the best one. It's the best music. Yes, of course, Janacek is very strong, and, and if you heard the Janufa or, or Katja, it's Katja is absolutely it's fantastic. And this is the last piece from him, and, and it's, the music is absolutely very, very strong. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I am very, very happy. It's everywhere in words. This Janáček is very popular. Just, I can say, in Czech Republic, Janáček is not the best one. He, he's not so popular in Czech Republic. He's more, more Smetana, yes, of course. Uh -huh. And I hope everybody from Czech Republic come now to London and can yeah. see this beautiful <laughs> production. And after we go to, to Prague and we can play this beautiful piece yeah. in Prague. Well, I'm sure London will love this yeah. production. It's just one hour, one and a half hour with play. That's, that's <laughs> a, a long it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a short piece, you know. It's it's really because we have three years ago was the new production in Prague. Yes. it was really a great production, mm -hmm. but I don't know why. Also, Yenufa, you know, everywhere it's very very popular, but in Czech Republic, really, it's more uh, Bedřich Smetana. You've spoken very nicely about the music. Is it very difficult? It is. It is very difficult, especially this piece. And also the fate of suit, it's, it's very difficult. Yenufa is much easier. Right. It's really much easier. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really beautiful because we are here three tenors. We can sing in something. <laughs> vincero, vincero. Oh. You know? <laughs> and it was we very nice. We need a new set of Because, tenors. you know, I ho uh, the maestro tell me, I was uh, maybe 20 years ago here in London. It was the House of the Dead in, in BBC with Andrew Davies. And I was the Shishkov. Uh, so, no, Shishkov, the... Shishkov, oh, wow, bravo. No, Shishkov, <laughs> it's the... Peter, what he said. Uh, well, uh, the big, big prisoner. No. Of course. Shapkin, yes, I was Shapkin. Oh, that's Peter Hall. In it's Peter Hall, yeah. yeah. It was Shapkin, and, and after the second one was in, in Salzburg. It was with Claudio Abado, and Goriachiko was really fantastic, and, and who was fantastic was was the English tenor, it's the, what's his name? The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was really, but really good. But Stefan, you say that it's uh, so difficult, the music. It is. Um, the music is difficult, I mean, really. Difficult you can see, whistle, Philip you know? Langridge, sorry, Philip Langridge, he was, yeah, yeah. He was great. Lanza, yes, I, I was just uh, thinking about words. It's not about difficult Stefan, for you. Uh, Of course, uh, I mean, opera is difficult. If yeah. you want to listen to opera, you have to know something about it. But, you know, difficult for my ears is bird whistle or something, uh, you know, we have people like Hansel. <laughs> I mean, Janáček is actually always beautiful. We were talking about that with Christoph because Christoph was introducing his production to us. Yeah. And uh, Graham Clark, uh, one of our beautiful and very famous colleagues, he said, but it's not all so dark. And it's quite 
quite true. It's not dark. There are beautiful moments, beautiful music. It it's like sometimes it's like a sum, summer meadow with flowers, and and then suddenly we have this dark moment which destroys everything. And that's the beauty of it. I think that that's very beautiful. So it is mm -hmm. difficult, but, but it, it what is, is not yeah. difficult? Life is difficult. But the end of it's easier. You are right. right. It's yeah. But you know, I have a second that it's a very small and the, be the best music in this piece. I'm so sorry, tenors. <laughs> oh, my plache, plache. It's the nice, yeah, yeah, yeah. nicest song. Yeah. It's so beautiful. It's a really a beautiful song, and and yeah, it's a nice music. And I hope everybody is coming for the, I'm sure the opening. Will. Now. So this idea of beauty, Pascal. Uh, beautiful music, yes, but subject matter pretty bleak from what I understand. Yeah. I'm yet to see the show, but yeah. reading the synopsis, is there light in it? Are your characters likeable? Do you need to be in order for us to listen to you for nearly two hours? It's a good question. I mean, I think there, there's a tremendous amount of prison drama if you look at Netflix and you know, yeah. there, there's series and series and series of you know, prison dramas and movies. Yeah. But, I mean, there's something, some, some, some kind of inherent fascination with what goes on in prison. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that was the whole um, this, the whole thing with this spark of God. You really can see that is that Janacek has has tried to really distill the humanity in each of each of the characters, even if they they're doing these, you know, for some of them some quite horrendous and shocking things. Yeah. Um, I think that there's this inherent vulnerability that that that, that shines. And uh, this ability for these prisoners to come together and, 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 and put together a play, for example, in Act Two, mm -hmm. and to have these, these, these moments that they're actually, they are creatures of God, you know? Yeah. Um, and that Act Two moment is pantomime. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 so it's a humorous moment. It's, it's a light. prison play. Yeah. It's a therapy. It is. That, yeah, a it's a, in, yeah, it's a therapy okay. session if yes. you want. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, we all, we are, I mean, I, I, every each character is actually asking for forgiveness. I mm -hmm. mean, that's not, we are not bad people inside. We have done bad things, yeah. but, but uh, and, and we still sometimes do. I mean, <laughs> so look at him. I'm very bad. And, uh, I'm uh, uh, exactly. Uh, but oh. but even, even him, he has also his moments where he says, oh my God, I'm actually sorry. Or, mm -hmm. Uh, if yeah, I would have done something else, I would. Yeah, my yeah. character is yeah. really bad. He's not bad. He's crazy, Justin. You know? <laughs> not bad. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm yeah. really very bad. I, have, I don't have to act either. I mean, Stephen, I'm just crazy. <laughs> you sound, Stefan, like you really enjoy being yeah. very bad. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a question here about identifying on stage. with characters. On stage, yes. On stage. Yes. Yeah, he's a beautiful person, actually. I mean, you can't see it. <laughs> I can see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we've seen it and we've heard it. But do you find it difficult then? You're a beautiful person off this stage, and on this stage you're, you're a horrible person. But have you found it easy to identify with these characters? Do you identify with the struggles that they go through, no. Stefan? No. If you're the stage director is great, and Krzysztof Valikovs is fantastic, really. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's no problem, because he's really very, very good. And, and uh, I worked with him before. Yeah. And it's really, it's for me, it's a fourth or fifth uh, production, and uh, I'm sure it's coming the best one. Yeah. And Pascal, you've sung this role as well before. That's right, yeah. Are you finding different things in this new production about your character? Yeah, this production is very different from the one that I did before. Um, Where was it that you were? I did a production uh, with Robert Carson in Strasbourg, right. and um, it was a very minimalist production, just four walls, very, very little on stage stage in terms of sets. It mm -hmm. was all sort of, you know, bricks and, you know, ball and chain and ragged costumes and very, very grey. Um, so, uh, whereas this production is very, very rich without telling too much, uh, yeah. saying too much about it. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of story building between the characters. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's a very fascinating production from that standpoint. Um, so yeah, it's 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 uh, it's always nice to be able to redo something because it, it's always a new discovery every single time that you redo a part. Yeah. Uh, but of course, there's also the enjoyment of, of of having the experience of having done it before, yeah. and so you can sort of pick and choose things that you have your confident work already. Yeah. yeah. And Ladislav, we've talking there about 
this idea of lots of interaction on stage, and it's a big cast. There are 18 solo roles, plus a men's chorus, plus actors. You are taking my word. Yeah, this is exactly what, what I wanted to talk about, that this, this opera is very special in one thing. We don't have a diva or a divo. We are, all, uh, we are all colleagues, and all of us, we are important. So they are not big or small roles. Of course, somebody has a little bit more to sing, somebody has a little bit less. But we all are very important to each other, and uh, that's so marvelous that we create relations yeah. on stage uh, for every single, for each single character. So Everyone it's a real, is, uh, counts. It's a real ensemble it's, it, piece. It, it's, it's, it's actually fam a family. Exactly as because Pascal was talking about this Netflix thing, and I was. Yeah. Uh, it's exactly what I was thinking about. The orange, the orange is new black, or something like that. I have seen. Yeah, yeah. I have seen one season. I actually don't like it, but if we imagine, <laughs> if somebody knows it, uh, it, it's all about women. It's in, in, in wim women prison, and we are. Our story is, with one exception, all about men. We mm -hmm. have one prostitute; who, she is girl. But otherwise, we are all men. So, imagine that sort of uh, society. Uh, what we is shown in this in this series, in ma in man in a man's world. Yeah. So we have to. We are not all bad. We are not doing bad things. We we, we have to cook for ourselves. We we have to live together. Mm -hmm. We have to make our clothes clean and stuff. This is a, a everyday program. You know, we have like a, the the normal day. So we, we we you cannot identify with you. You can identify with your character very easily because it's a man. It's a man who did mistake. It was a big mistake, or who did many mistakes, and who cannot get better. But it's still a, a human being. So. Uh, that's very touching for me, and then my character especially. He's still in love, and then that's he get that, that's why he gets crazy because there is no, no solution for him, yeah. in his uh, frustration. Yeah, we need in this piece. Uh, sorry, no, uh, go ahead. Uh, really a big concentration because you know is that piece is not so long. It's one hour forty minutes, thirty five minutes yeah. without intermission, and everybody's on stage. It's, it's mm -hmm. really that way. I think. It's really difficult. Yeah, there's no yeah. break. <coughs> no break. There's and no also break. Janacek is using only uh, uh, some, some uh, sequences. It's not like, sometimes it's not even a sentence. It's like only two words to say something. Where you have to really think with it, with it and you have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. It's very good that you're all here because it, this is the preparation. So I'm very happy <laughs> for you because you're going to enjoy it very well, very much uh, more than, than people who would not be ready. Because yeah. it's not being, you know, it's not Bohem, you know, it's not, it's not <laughs> the Chile. No, if you're here for Bohem, sorry. Um, I did want to actually talk about this all male. I'm, as you'll see, I'm pretty outnumbered this evening, but this is a pretty accurate reflection of, of the stage and what we'll see on the evening. As you mentioned, there's yeah. a brief appearance um, from a mezzo soprano um, for just a couple of minutes playing a female prostitute. I was wondering what it's like being part of an all-male cast. Is, it, is the dynamic on stage different from other productions dynamic. you might have been yeah, on? absolutely. No. Hmm. Um, it makes the rehearsal process different, I would say. Hmm. In what way Do different? It's not, no. I don't know, because uh, we was at Ladislav together in production, uh, there was the Patrick Sherlock production. This yes. production was everywhere, was in Teatro Scala, was in Metropolitan Opera. And uh, really, the, it was a great time with Patricia Rowe because he was really fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, but I'm so happy I am here now in London and we have a new production, something new, you know? And, and the maestro is great, Christoph is great, and uh, it's something new for me. And but so we happy. don't. I mean, uh, that's that's the, the question. If we or if we miss women or not? I mean, um, no. Actually, no, in this you know, piece not. so so uh, in the in the Patricia uh, uh, production and also here, we actually do the thing that we we tra transverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quite often, because yeah. you need women in the world, of course. We are very happy for them to have them. And if you are not allowed to have them, <laughs> then, then you have to do something about it. So you just, oh, uh, no. you are a woman, you know? So we don't miss them because we have them. I mean, I have my Luisa. Oh. That's true. I, I do get to wear a dress. Well, this is, this, is, this yes. is probably Alea too is much too much said, but I, no, I don't for. think so that we miss something. No, it's, uh, and we are very polite to each other. It's amazing, and we have like beautiful people around us. I mean, Willard. And, <laughs> it and, is. Yeah. I yeah. mean, o all of these big people from from twenty years ago are still big with us. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's very nice. That's mm. very nice. It feels like a bit like a sports team sometimes. Yeah. You know, is that kind of camaraderie? And we don't pretend. We really like each other. Yeah. 
<laughs> and Pascal and Ladislav, I believe this is your first time here at Covent Garden, is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. How is it? Welcome, for a start. <laughs> uh, the rehearsing room is fine. Good. That's what it's I a good mean. rehearsal room, yeah, <laughs> exactly. no, it's very good. It's, it's got, got, windows. It's got windows. windows. It's got yeah, windows, it's yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which Light, is very uncommon, you know? which, very uncommon. Yeah. Yeah. And people are very, very professional. I mean, everybody who is taking care of us are doing a great job. So thank I'm you. Very thank you. It's a little beehive. It's a very busy place. It is. Yeah. A final question, and I'd like to ask it to all of you. Stefan, we'll start with you. Does this opera have contemporary relevance? Difficult. Value. <laughs> um, no? I don't know. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Value. Hmm. Well, are there themes? So we, we Netflix and, and that idea of prison, are we seeing similar things in those Netflix no. series that no. we're seeing on this stage? No. 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 Absolutely not. I've got you stumped. Mm -hmm. but, but there is this, I mean, we, on, on, the, uh, on the stage we have, we have this uh, space of, of prison. I mean, you always, uh, already, by, by the first view, you, you recognize where you are. I mean, that makes us feel, um, that's quite, quite mm. concrete. It's nothing. I would say it's more of a timeless piece because um, you identify with the emotions of the characters. I think without going into the d details about which, why every single character actually found themselves in prison, yeah. um, you identify with the, the, the motives for those crimes, mm -hmm. you yeah, know? Right. And, 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 and the, the passion is the same, whether it's 400 years ago or right now, yeah. people feel the same right. things. The same emotions yeah, you're dealing absolutely. with. Mm. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank That's you all we've so got time much. for with you. Thank Good you. luck with the rest of the thank rehearsal process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I hope everybody's coming. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Later tonight, we'll be joined by the director of this new production, Christoph Waliskowski, um, who'll be talking to us about what it's like to tackle a piece of this magnitude. Uh, but first, to introduce us to Janacek's dramatic score, please welcome conductor Mark Wigglesworth. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Um, I wondered first if you could tell us briefly about your relationship with Janacek. Is, you've conducted Janacek before. Have you conducted From the House of the Dead before? I've not done this one. I've done Katya and Yenufa. Um, it's very easy music to conduct because everything comes from the text. Debussy said that the problem with Italian opera is that the orchestra are always waiting for the singers. And the problem <laughs> with German opera is that the singers are always waiting for the orchestra. <laughs> And what he did, and what composers contemporary to him did, such as Janacek and Berg, is they created this perfect synchronicity between text and music, in which the timing of the delivery of the line that an actor would give it is essentially exactly the same as the singer does it. There are very few pauses that the singers ever have, because we don't pause on a word when we speak it. And one of the things, reasons I think Janacek was quite a late developer in terms of success, at least, he was over, over 50 before Yennefer became uh, successful, was that it was, there was a feeling that he had to wait for the musical language at the start of the 20th century to be the sort of musical language that he wanted, mm. that he felt was appropriate for opera. He was born before La Traviata and he died after Wozzeck. That's an extraordinary <laughs> life. Uh, so much change, and so much changed in music as well. And I think the reason I find it um, relatively easy to conduct is that if, you, if, if the singer is able to deliver the text as an actor in, in the sincerest way, then the speed with which that goes is kind of obvious. And so you, you, you sort of feel that in terms of tempo anyway, which is probably the most superficial and but nevertheless important part of our job, mm -hmm. that is taken care of by the truth of the line, the context of the dramatic situation, and most importantly, the contribution of the performer 
and the director as well. And so in the room, you find the truth uh, of that moment. And it, it's, it feels unequivocal, so that by the time you get to the performance, that is what you are, uh, that's what you're delivering. Let's talk about the score. We shared a couple of minutes a few days ago looking at some pretty extraordinary pieces of paper. I wonder if you can talk us through that, the journey that this score's been on. Yes, I mean, Gavin's gave a very, a very wonderful and, and, and straightforward explanation. I've got a few examples that we know, whilst Janicek was writing this piece, that he, that he was incredibly exhausted by doing so, but incredibly excited about finishing it. He was writing about, it's coming to the end. And then he finally says, I finished it. And if we look at the score of the manuscript, which at one page you've already seen, Gosh. you can see why some people might doubt whether that is finished. <laughs> uh, as Gavin said, some, the, 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 talked about the, the manuscript lines, that's part of the confusion. But it's, you, you can see the passion of that and the total commitment, the, the emotion. That doesn't help us much with the actual notes, but it certainly helps us with what is behind them and, and the energy or, or, or even simplicity of it. It does look like it was just came out all in a rush and it ended up a little bit of a mess, but a beautiful one. If we go to the next slide, this is the score that uh, he had made a, a fair copy of and he saw and he oversaw this. And so we know it is what, that is a, a literal and valid interpretation of the sprawling uh, manuscript that you saw. The problem with this version, this page, is this also includes the so-called improvements that his pupils Klubner and Bacala added. In real life, you, it's very clear to see what is Janacek and what is his students. Um, it's, it's quite, because one is in paint pen and one is in, in um, pencil. What you can't, if you look at the second bar, uh, there you can see um, the vocal line, there's some words about five lines up. There you can see that they're a little bit thinner than the ones, just the line above to the left. You can also see that there's a repeat mark on those first two bars. If you were able to look at the real thing, you would see that those things weren't written by Janacek, they were written by the pupils. And the very last detail, but it is not insignificant, is the very last bar of the score is a snare drum roll, and you can see a diminuendo on that. It is at the very end of Act Two. If you can imagine the difference between a very loud snare drum roll with a mysterious enigmatic diminuendo, or one that doesn't have a diminuendo at all and is absolutely epic right through to the end, that is, a, that is not just a sort of nuance change. That is a very strong emotional uh, difference, one version or the other. Um, Nick is going to play for us. Let's do the Im so-called improved version. He's going to play a little bit before the music you, you see. I'll, I'll, um, I'll do some kind of gesture when, you hit, when it hits the page. And he's going to do it in the version that the students, uh, that the pupils created. At all, but if you play it with, if you play the more uncompromising version, the word there, the, what the chorus, the, what the chorus says, will be for, which means murder. Um, somebody's, they think somebody's just been killed. So it's a very dramatic moment. They rush on and they say murder, and Janáček only wanted them to say it once. Why would you, why would you not, why would you not say it only once? It's, it's this sort of operatic convention to say everything twice or even more times. Janáček, no, <laughs> once is enough. And, uh, and that's all they say. And then, at the, then the little bit at the end is they say, God saved him. But that's not really the point here. The point is they just say murder once, because once is enough for Janicek. So, and this is with the, um, the more terrifying absence of a snare drum roll uh, diminuendo at the end.
other. So it's a kind of, you know, you can see it's a slightly simplistic example, but it's, it's one that I think shows very clearly the, the, the uncompromising Janáček's original. And um, the, the version that, that the, stu the pupils created was done for many, many years. It wasn't until the 80s when Charles McCarris and John Tyrrells looked at this again and said, well, hang on a minute, surely we can go back now that Janáček is well known, we, why don't we do what, um, what he wrote? But even in the 1980s, it's hard for us to realize now, because Janáček is so accepted as a genius and a, and a sort of significant part of our operatic uh, lives. But in the 1980s, he wasn't. And it's thanks to Macarius and Tyrrell that, that, that he became so popular in a way. Um, but even they, because Janáček was not so celebrated, even they didn't feel they could go quite the whole way. So in the, the 1980s, in the version that Sir Charles Macarius recorded, they, do the, they still do the repeat. They don't do the little extra words, and they, but they still do the snare drum roll. Because in those days, there was a feeling, well, Janáček still does need a little bit of extra selling. And they were probably right, because it certainly worked. But John Tyrrell has gone back now, as of, as of literally now, and said, no, we can absolutely trust what Janáček wrote. And so um, our production is, will be the world premiere of the end of this act, because it will be the first one that simply does what he wrote. Sort of warts and all, but it's, uh, they're warts that are fantastically interesting. Fascinating. That's, you know, that's just a detail, but that is going through, that happens throughout the whole score. And um, again, Gavin touched on this. They, the, Klubner and Bakala kind of logicalized the characters and tried to make all the stories make complete sense. And uh, some of the text doesn't make sense in, in the sense of what Janáček wrote. And I think that's OK. Um, the T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which was written only a few years before, is a very similar description of, 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 of a sort of in, illogical world where people were trying to make sense of it, mixing memory and desire. And I don't know if Janáček read that poem, but there's a kind of abstract collage quality to it that, feel, that I think today, with our trust of the composer and our openness to illogicality in art, we can cope with doing exactly what he wrote. And let's talk about what this piece is about for you. I know when we spoke earlier, you talked about this quote that in every creature a spark of God. Can you talk to me about what you think this piece is about? I think it's about the fact that that people that everybody is worth more than the worst thing they have done. And we see terrible people on stage. We see people who've done absolutely terrible things. But does that mean they are not people? Of course it doesn't. And and if you just read the text and you just take the words from the characters, they are inexplicable people in many cases. The music transcends that and, and gives us their humanity in the way that music can do more powerfully than any other art form. So you hear the text that they are delivering. If you heard it without the music, it would be a challenge to have empathy with them. But with the music underneath, not only their singing, but the orchestras uh, give of it, you, you sense. I mean, he writes that he writes it in every creature the spark of God. We've said that a lot. One of the most extraordinary lines is at the at the, at the death of of Luca Stefan Margita's character, who, who is sort of simplistically speaking the worst of them all. The old prisoner said, "Even he had a mother," and that's an extraordinary line. For yes, we have to try to understand these people and. To answer the question that you asked the singers about the relevance of this yeah. piece, we have to understand people. We have to feel empathy for people we don't understand. And, and we have to try to find a connection with them yeah. because we are related. And it's not enough as a society or as an individual simply to say, I'm going to lock you up. I don't need to engage in you. Because that is a reflection of us. That's not a reflection of that person's crime how we deal with it, how we try to understand these people, um, is how we as a society function. And I think the music gives us a wonderful uh, window into the 
souls, the real souls of, the, of these um, murderers and, and, yeah. And how does Janacek do that? What are the, the things that we'll hear in the music that, that give us that idea? Well, beauty. I mean, you, the music's incredibly beautiful. And obviously, it's very hard to dismiss beauty. And it is disconcerting when you hear somebody engage in, in the fact that they've killed somebody with an undercurrent of, of, of beauty behind it. it. It is disconcerting in the best sense of the word. And we've talked about this being quite a male piece, but I know that there's some interest in the score that, that maybe gives us a bit of a kind of feminine presence. Well, they talk about women all the time. I mean, it, we are, there's only men on the stage, or almost only men on the stage, and yet they spend a lot of the time talking about women. And I think it is a very, uh, it, it is a, just as much a feminine piece as it is a masculine piece. Before I really under, knew it, I used to think of From the House of the Dead as kind of some grim, it's just men in a prison sort of singing about stuff. It's, it's, it's so much richer than that because in so many cases they're talking about the women in their lives, whether it's their mother or their, or their lover or their wife. And so, again, the orchestra brings us that um, femininity, if you like. There is the kind of, this is obviously simplistic stereotypes, which I hate, but there is the kind of sharp-edged, angular, masculine music, and underneath there is this far more, this far more of the anima uh, than the animus, actually. Mm -hmm. And the orchestra itself, I understand there are some unusual sounds coming from the pit, and Gavin talked briefly about it, but what kind of noises well, it, might we hear that we're not used to hearing? It's wonderful, because the orchestra is rather large. These extra sounds, you're actually going to be able to see them. They're kind of because they'll be in the boxes at the side. Yeah. They won't impinge on what you see in terms of the stage. But to, when Janacek, what do you think he means by asking for somebody for a sawing? Well, he means somebody sawing a piece of wood. And I asked the player, I asked him why, in the rehearsal, why he stopped too soon. He said, I ran out of wood. <laughs> so, it's, and Jana, it was very, it's very much Janacek's style to want, he wants a saw. He, there's chains, that's obviously, that's kind of not just symbolic, that's a real sound. There's an axe, there's a uh, rattle, there's all kind of real sounds going on uh, within the, within the, 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 more, um, the more impressionistic colours of the instruments themselves all played by some of the best instrumentalists in the world. I know, they've been studying for 30 years and they end up to chopping wood. Piece of wood. <laughs> <laughs> and let's talk about the chorus. We, we talked earlier to the, the gentleman about this being a real ensemble piece and we have the 18 main plus a male chorus. How does Janacek use the chorus in this piece? I think everybody on stage is the chorus, or not quite everybody. The, 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 the prison authorities would not be and the Dostoevsky-type narrator character, the character that, that Willard White plays, Goryanchikov, he is not chorus, but everybody else, I think the impression is that everybody's the chorus, and we just happen to hear certain people's stories stepping out from the chorus. Um, I think the feeling is that if Goryanchikov was not released at the end, and therefore the narrator leaves the stage, we would hear everybody's story. And if you hung around loud enough, uh, sorry, if you ha hung around long enough, mm. then you would hear every member of the chorus's story. It would be a very long week. But you would, <laughs> that should be the feeling. And, and Janacek often didn't specify who should sing which line. Prisoner one, prisoner A. We've created or we're trying to create a, a little more logical narrative and character development so that you can, the audience can find stories of individuals and, and sort of hold on to their journeys throughout the piece. But you could argue for another way in which, apart from the four main narrations, all the other lines are completely randomly interjected. And for me, the, the point of that is that we, it connects us, the audience, with the, the sort of universality of, of everybody. They are all in prison, which hopefully is not something we can relate to, but we can relate to the th Janacek talks about a vibrating string that connects us all. And for me, the chorus are the symbol of that connection between the stage and, uh, and us. This is the first time for 10 years that the Royal Opera is putting on a, a piece of Janacek. And it's the first, as we heard earlier, the first in series of four that we'll present over the next <coughs> couple of years. What do you think it is about now? Why is there appetite for Janacek now? that maybe there wasn't there before? 
Well, I think in the last 10 years, this, this company has shown that there's no limits to what they feel is appropriate to mm. put on. Maybe, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, there was a sort of cliche that it should be more traditional work. I don't sense that at all, whether it's Hades or Benjamin or Bertwistle or Turnage. Janicek is just a, an accepted part of the culture of opera. And if you believe that opera is theatre, and opera is the sung word in a dramatic context, and you want to hear that done by the greatest performers in the world in the most magical place, why would you not put it on? And so I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of what will undoubtedly be the best performance from, from the House of the Dead here ever. <laughs> roh.org.uk, get your tickets. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So we heard a little bit more there about the score, and now we're going to hear some more from that amazing score. Uh, please welcome back Ladislav Elger and repetitor Nick Fletcher to perform Skuratov's story from Act Two. Na drugi den 
Šel jsem k jeho magazínu, dívám se v okno, sedí Němec 45 let, nos hrbatý, oči vypulené, hodinky spravuje. Chtěl jsem rozbít okno, myslím si ale náš, Propadlo, co z vozu upadlo. Přišel jsem k večeru do kasáren, lech jsem a Petroviči hořce zaplakal. Zní přísahu, že mne znát nebude. Když jsem věděl, že se to skončí, vezmu plášť a rovnou k ním. Pro všechen případ sudnul jsem pistolet. Vejdu! Ženich počesaný ve frdako, Lojza naproti němu, Z boku stady slustý, Se je vlčí, Německy bez vlastí. Lojza zbledla, Co vám lípo, Pravil Němec, Co mi lípo, Ostavíte jí, Vodky nalívej, jak to mě v posti přišel. Sedněte. A co ty tak hrobě? Jsi mi druhém, kdo k tobě s přátelstvím. Nemohu jim být, ty zprostý boják. Ty hastroši, víš, že já mohu s tebou dělat, co chci. Chceš, bych tě zastřelil. To nesmíte dělat, nesmím, ne. Tak tu máš, vyšla ráda, cvady, ženské křičí. Já utekl. Soudili, usoudili zelenou ulici. Thank you to Ladislav and Nick there for that incredible performance. Now, please welcome the man tackling this piece for the very first time for the Royal Opera, director of this new production, Christoph Walaskowski. <laughs> Christoph, thank you very much for joining us. The first question I wanted to ask was, why this piece? What was it about from the House of the Dead which made you want to direct it? Uh, it was the f uh, second opera by Janacek. I uh, have got a proposal. Um, and after the experience with uh, Macropolis case, I was completely seducted. And on both levels, music and the story, mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, um, uh, Janacek is very um, open structure. And uh, it's uh, about your imagination then. So the challenge was um, obvious for so me. So you felt that there's something in this piece that allows freedom? 
you know, it's very it's very complicated because from one side, you know, Macropolis, Macropolis case, it's mm -hmm. uh, all about woman, yeah. um, eternity. I mean, the character and probable uh, someone who has got uh, the secret of uh, eternity, mm -hmm. someone who has lived for 500, uh, 500 years. And the question is, uh, should I continue? So <laughs> it's enormous. And from the other side, it's uh, um, House of Dead. It's uh, right, the first question, just man, uh, first thing should be prison, then man, yeah. and uh, so no women, no uh, something which uh, organizes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now in the way the opera is organized around of uh, around of women, uh, so this, <laughs> this time it's uh, something completely else. So it's completely new experience, and as well uh, lack of obvious uh, um, uh, obvious uh, first roles. So that um, the feeling of an ensemble piece. Right. And what ideas are you exploring in this production? Pardon? What ideas are you exploring in this production? For me, of course, was the most uh, provoking. It's uh, it's like we are invited to get into the prison mm -hmm. and to stay there for two years and to leave with a question: What will happen during these two years with us? I mean, uh, I mean, potentially, uh, potentially, we are all. Uh, maybe one day criminals, mm -hmm. you know. You, you, we all in, have that to I mean, when, when you say today, because one of uh, main character, it's uh, he says political uh, and political prisoner. My question would be like, what is today to be political prisoner? Mm -hmm. So uh, you never know. I mean, this is very philosophical, what I'm saying about that from one day to another we can uh, get there yeah. without understanding. And this is what happened to uh, this uh, Goryanchikov, uh, who calls himself a political prisoner. Yeah. Now, the text doesn't geographically place us anywhere. Where have you chosen to, to set your production? Uh, actually, it's, uh, you, you know, Janacek is very addicted to Russian culture, literature, to Dostoevsky, and uh, of course, the very experience of Dostoevsky was to be banished at a certain moment uh, as a political prisoner into Siberia. So, uh, Libretto is based on this uh, personal experience of Dostoevsky, who did spend, uh, I don't know, one year or more in Siberia. And the result of this uh, confrontation with this world was uh, uh, what he wrote. Uh, of course, uh, you, you know, like to, to give to that, this color, it's, it's like making it very far away from us. So uh, from the other side, it's not that easy to give an another color. Or uh, you can't choose, like, OK, I'm, I'm doing this in this country or on this continent. And so it's not about that. So it, it's uh, rather from more general questions, uh, um, philosophical, which uh, this uh, piece um, um, maybe even stronger, in stronger way than theater can, mm -hmm. because the music creates a world. Yeah. Uh, 
I think it happens in the uh, minds of uh, these uh, guys. So it's, uh, it's the imagination, it's uh, all these D books which we try to get. Uh, and my questions are about justice, about uh, what does it mean prison, what does it mean punishment, does punishment correct us, does punishment can make us uh, again normal, what does it mean to be different, mm -hmm. what is this difference, and why, why, yeah. and why. You mentioned earlier when we were talking this idea of everyone having a past and a present. Is that a, a theme that you've come back to often whilst directing this? Uh, because in this piece you have no the story, there is no narration. Mm. It's, it's like time yeah. which starts with arrival of a new one new prisoner yeah. with a new different and then we follow the life there and it's finishing with him living being liberated mm -hmm. we never understood why he was condemned yeah i understand this this piece you talk there about the entrance of a character being the start of it and, and the end, there being a very clear end, but it feels like it's quite episodic that we hear these individual stories, individual There, there is like a frame, and in, in, inside of this frame you can uh, follow a lot of lines, like one of this line, it's uh, to follow two characters, uh, Luca Kuzmich, I mean, uh, what Stefan did think uh, at the beginning, mm -hmm. and, and another character, Shishkov. And Shishkov, who is taking in Act Three an enormous place. I mean, he's singing for 15 minutes his story. Yeah. And so, and he, he wouldn't sing for Act One, Two, so we know nothing about him. And then suddenly we, we've got uh, to his story. Mm -hmm. And in this, uh, at the end, appears in another character, which we know. And this is the guy who is the cause of the fact that he became a killer, etc., etc., so and there the is this uh, confrontation unexpected for both. So they leave one close to the other one, and uh, one day they do discover this is the man uh, who destroyed me, and this yeah. is the man I hate mm -hmm. the most in the world, and this is the man I've been thinking for years and years. What I would do if I see him again. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier the, the Dostoevsky novel. Did you read it beforehand? No. No. Was that a conscious decision? No, I, I mean, let's say. I mean, my period of Dostoevsky was when I was 18 until uh, something, you know. Right. And there are some novels I'm back, <laughs> but not this one. And from the other side, I, I, I didn't want to go back to something, I mean, which, which is not necessarily uh, important with my point of view. I didn't want, I didn't want to be you know, taken again mm -hmm. by this Dostoevsky's world. I think it's so strong and powerful. I, I, I don't want to, to, to get back to, the, to his style, to his yeah. way of seeing. I, I wanted to discover uh, with Janacek and uh, with this libretto without thinking about Dostoevsky and about, about thinking about this, uh, this kind of literature. And we've talked this evening about how 
outnumbered I am and, and how that's reflected in, on the stage and in that on the surface at least in terms of what we're seeing, we're seeing a cast of, of men. We're in a society now that talks a lot about feminine, uh, uh, feminism and equality. Do you think this piece has a special resonance at the moment, being all male? Look, I was always convinced that there is uh, some, like a big conflict yeah. between women and men, and it's our uh, life, and it's our discovery, it's our dialogue, it's our learning, it's our capacities, I don't know. And of course, what, what, what's happening now, it's, 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 it's like, you, you know, like we are always fighting like to get somewhere together. Yeah. You know, so uh, of course, uh, uh, especially prison is uh, the kind of, uh, we are uh, hunted yeah. by phantoms of women. Mm -hmm. I mean, beautiful, beloved, and as well betraying, ugly, yeah. which destroyed us. Uh, so, and I would say this haunting of today, yeah. you know, it's very general haunting. And I don't know if it, uh, if there is something uh, sane in it. Of course, <laughs> these things exist, and yeah. we must talk about it. But uh, and it's, it, but it has it been something that you've been very aware of when you're making this piece? Look, uh, I, I mean, uh, strangely, this prison becomes in Act Two all about theater. So prisoners uh, perform. Yeah. We we know that it's a kind of work on ourselves. Yeah. It gives possibility to say something which we wouldn't say in a different uh, mm. situation. Uh, so, but, and then you discover like kind of parody of uh, Don uh, Giovanni, or we, we call, uh, the character is called uh, Don Juan. Mm. I mean, uh, less uh, concrete. Right. Uh, and, 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 and then it's, uh, it's about uh, okay, next one, next one, next one, next mm -hmm. one. Uh, so it's like from a prison uh, perspective, it's very simplifying, of course, and, uh, and the, the conflict is enormous yeah. between men and women. Let's talk about that moment in Act Two where it becomes a play, and, and I've heard it, and I've seen it written as a pantomime. I've not seen the work yet, but reading synopsis of it, it feels quite bleak, but there's humor in it. You know, it's kind of uh, prison uh, humor. Prison humor. <laughs> Dark humor. I, I mean, you can think about this as a pantomime, and you can think about this as a reaction, or uh, I, I, I must like um, explode. You know, so, so, so sometimes the woman is just like a punching bag for my, uh, you know, so mm -hmm. it's completely awful. Let's talk on stage is, is all male, but your creative team is a, is a mix. And you work with the same, same designers. All of your team, your dramaturg, is, is always someone that you work with. What is it about those people that, that drew you to them? And can you talk a little bit how, about how you work with them? <laughs> it, it's to, to be very close to each other, so... Uh, uh, it's it's not a conventional work when the set uh, designer is coming and proposing you something. Mm -hmm. It's 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 rather being together, 
So it's dialogue from the very beginning. You're, you're talking, it's a very Right, w without insisting, without pushing. And, and um, moments of life when suddenly you see something and you say, oh, it might be interesting there. Yeah. Uh, so it's very fresh and it's uh, like, uh, mm, it's not a hard job on a table and we must find something, you know. B before you realize anything, you, you've got years. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's three or four years you live with a uh, piece and uh, you don't rush. You just don't want to miss it. You, you want to understand it. And you don't want uh, um, uh, concepts. You don't want ideas, ready things. You know, you don't want uh, anything finished. By the way, until the first moment you meet uh, singers, you you don't really know what it's going to be, mm -hmm. because it depends a lot of, about the energy of the whole group, and and then your meeting is giving you slightly answers without never giving you all answers. Yeah. Maybe the show only once it's uh, performed and uh, next one and next one uh, gets uh, further. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's really excited now to see this production on stage. <laughs> Crystal, stay with me. I don't have any more questions, but I hope our audience will. Um, I'm going to welcome back Mark Wigglesworth as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is your opportunity to, to ask Christoph and Mark anything that you might want to uh, about this piece. I will uh, repeat the question, so if you can shout it down, and then I'll just speak it back to the gents. Do we have any questions? None at all. <coughs> yes. So, gentlemen, let me just, uh, is there a way that this lady can prepare for watching this piece for the first time? Look, I, I can tell you my experience. When, uh, so I've been offered to do this opera, and when I arrived to Covent Garden, and I wanted to see shows, and I wanted to see audience, and uh, I was va vaguely still uh, in uh, the piece, and I was thinking, like, yes, this opera demands something completely else mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. So, uh, and so I was watching uh, um, ballet, something, and I was thinking, what about if, you know, there is a black guy playing basketball on the stage? And it opened immediately, you know, a way toward this opera. So you shouldn't prepare yourself, probably, because it's. Uh, I think it's 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 rather it's going to be a surprise. You can't compare this opera to other operas, uh, this world to other worlds. You can't expect. There are any opera rules in it. Mark, do you agree? I would urge you not to prepare at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I would urge everybody never to prepare for an opera. Not, not even to read the synopsis. I mean, whatever one thinks about surtitles, why read the synopsis? Do you prepare when you go to the theatre? No. Do you, do, when you go to see a play, do you, do you want to know what happens at the end before? before? No. And opera is, is, is theatre, and, and the less one comes with any sense of preconception or expectation, the better, because then you're in the moment, and you're absolutely free to relate to it spontaneously in exactly the way that you want to relate to it, not the way you think you should have related to it. And, 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 and 
I think particularly this piece, one that doesn't have a, 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 a clear narrative, just come and be open to being part of it. Any other questions? Yes, there at the back. Perhaps more musically, um, I haven't actually seen this opera myself, but I have recently seen uh, the Edinburgh and um, also Britain's Billy Bart with the magnificent Stefan Malikstein in Prague. Um, <laughs> and from what, you, from what have you heard tonight, if I were to close my eyes and I didn't know that we're listening to Yanache, it sounded more like Britain than like Yanufa. Is that, is that a fair comment? And I'm just wondering, did something happen with Yanache between Yanufa and from the House of the Dead? Because to me, it just sounded very different. <coughs> So well, it was 25 years later, and uh, most composers became more efficient and more honest and more uncompromising towards the end of their life. And so he, there is a honesty about this last piece. It doesn't waste any notes, it doesn't waste any instruments, it doesn't waste any voices. That is something that Britain would have carried on, I think. But I think to compare Yennefer and... Um, from the House of the Dead is to compare uh, the 19th century with the 20th century. They are not; they are completely different worlds. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned um, Charles Mercarus. In a nutshell, how important? So how important was Charles Macarius in bringing uh, Janáček to English audiences? Probably crucial. It's hard to know what would have happened without such an advocate. Um, but certainly before he started championing those, these pieces outside um, Czechoslovakia, the um, people didn't believe in them. And, and it was his commitment to doing them that made them... I mean, who knows if somebody else would have taken on that mantle if, if he hadn't, but he, but he certainly is, is, um, is significant in, in giving, making sure that the performances were sincere and passionate and being such a good advocate for the composer as a result. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So, Christoph, do you start, when you're coming to a production, do you start by looking at the text or the music? At the same both. I, I'm, I'm not reading the text if I'm not uh, listening to the music. Right. Uh, so, every session of my work, it's always uh, going through the opera with, with the music mm -hmm. and uh, the text. Any other questions? Well, I think the time has come to wrap up. Thank you very much. Um, huge thanks to all of our guests this evening and to our audience. Um, don't forget that you can see this powerful story of tragedy and forgiveness here at the Royal Opera House from the 7th to the 24th of March. Visit the Royal Opera House website to get your tickets. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>